I'll just order. Um, sorry, we're late. Uh, had a meeting before this that ran over. It's all Eric's fault. All right. Uh, any adjustments to the agenda from anybody? Um, we have people in the audience this evening. This is very exciting. Really far away. Um, uh, so I would ask uh, anybody sitting out there in the hinterlands if they have anything they want to speak about that's not on the agenda uh, at this point, or if uh, we go along, obviously, I've, questions are always welcome and, and so forth. Um, hearing nothing. Uh, we have a presentation this evening on the math programs at uh, our wonderful school. So uh, take it away. And Stephanie? Stephanie, I didn't know Penny exactly who was, I didn't. Yes. <laughs> So Penny Stearns is our math coordinator, and we will be co-presenting. All right, I don't go up and around here. Sorry, we're not getting. I didn't see your text until I figured it out. Okay. We got creative with your stuff. We did it all. <laughs> so the common theme that we have been addressing is academic rigor at CCS. Um, we talked about that with literacy and our language arts program at our last presentation, and we're focusing on mathematics for this presentation. So I think the big piece that speaks to rigor in our math program and just what we tend to hear a lot about from parents is that math is very different for their students than it was when we learned math and there has been a significant paradigm shift which is what we we use in our educational jargon um, and we frequently work with um, some great work by joe bowler who has come out of stanford that really and this quote by her really addresses that paradigm shift in that some students think their role in math classrooms is to memorize all the steps and methods and I would say that when I was learning math, that was what I was expected to do. Other students think their role is to connect ideas. These different strategies link, unsurprisingly, to achievement, and the students who memorize are the lowest achieving in the world. As, go ahead, Penny. Yeah. And I think that that kind of speaks to what our goals are, our classroom teachers, is when we're teaching mathematics, our goal is not for kids to complete a problem and get an answer. Our goal is to allow children to learn mathematics so that they can continue to learn mathematics. So just getting the answer is not the goal. We want kids to have answers, but we want them to have answers so that they've learned the mathematics to have the ability to further learn mathematics. In preparing this, the, f the first year that I was at Charlotte was as math coordinator, so this was kind of a fun full circle presentation for me to work on with Penny. And I came in in the year that CSSU made the full shift to the updated Bridges curriculum and the updated Connected Math project, and it was our first full year of Common Core sta State Standards implementation. And I remember giving a presentation and working on it at that point and talking about what the core shifts in the Common Core standards were and how they translated to the teaching and learning of mathematics. And there were really three areas that directed the shift in the standards. The first one being focus, and that really is that there is more focus within the standards. Prior to using Common Core State Standards to guide our work when we were working with the Vermont Framework, the four areas of mathematic or the f mathematics or the four strands were spread pretty equally across K-12. And that meant students got a lot of different math at every grade level. And the focus here is just narrowing and deepening the mathematical concepts and skills that are focused on in each grade level to build a strong progression over the K-12 span. That also speaks to greater coherence in the math, that the learning is carefully connected across grade levels so that new understanding is built upon a foundation of earlier learning, and we treat those as progressions. And then rigor being focusing on pursuing major conceptual understanding, inclusive of procedural skill and fluency, 
but really targeting that conceptual understanding and application across different situations with an equal intensity in what students are learning. Do you want to add anything to that, Penny? Um, I think the next slide talks a little bit more about the coherence. So here you can see where there is a focus where you can see um, that measurement and data will just go just through K-5, but then that turns into that statistics and probability. You can see that counting really doesn't go through much more than the middle of first grade, but then that moves into number and operations of fractions and base 10. So that's kind of an example of the focus and the coherence of the topics of mathematics. So along with rigor, of being of the change of the standards. Some standards were moved grade levels from the GEs and some were moved up, a couple, a few were moved down. But here's an example of not any more difficult mathematics, but an application of mathematics that students already know. Um, this comes out of a grade five, um, our grade five program. Uh, there are many steps that you could scaffold to get from one-fourth of 36 to 25 times 36. Um, I don't know, anyone want to take a, how a fifth grader might approach this? Or even how you might approach it. <clears throat> the corner is 0.25, so if you know that a quarter of 36 is nine, and you would know that 25 times 36 is 900. Right, but that place value piece, the, the, the how is 0.25 related to 25? So there's lots of steps. And uh, when Stephanie and I were pulling this together, none of those concepts were challenging for a fifth grade student. But deciding which of these concepts to apply to this problem allows for the rigor. So the coherence, the focus, and the rigor really build, starting with what we're doing with our kindergartners right through eighth grade, and then it does continue to build on nine through 12. Um, and this is a lot of the work that we've been doing with teachers, is focusing on what are the math progressions through the grades, and then what are the major clusters of concepts and skills at each grade level. And I would say at this point, our teachers are getting very skilled at knowing and using what's coming in the grade levels before them to access new learning with their students in the grade level that they're in. But they also have that lens on what's coming after. And being able to connect previous learning to current learning and really planting seeds for that future learning has become a pretty intentional part of our instructional practice of our professional development and professional learning with teachers, which is providing greater coherence for our students as they move through grade levels. Do you want to talk about the push towards algebra? Or um, well, this is, you know, the, the progression moving towards algebra. So I think that, you know, when I was in school, Algebra 1 was in ninth grade. The Common Core standards take a lot of the algebra concepts, take them, really break them down apart, and they're introduced across the elementary through eighth grade. Most of our students in Charlotte have um, accomplished all the algebra standards by the end of eighth grade. Explain that a little bit more clearly. So they're not literally taking algebra, but bits and pieces of that are incorporated into the curriculum. Right, and um, so, uh, so for example, algebra standards in the at the elementary, which is where I'm most knowledgeable, um, has a lot to do with the communicating in a symbolic way. So the use of variables. You think about. When I was in school, variables weren't interest, introduced until algebra. You know, we did arithmetic. But now, the use of variables is introduced in third and fourth grade. So for example, I am working with a group of third graders. And they are um, working on multiplication. 
And so we're generalizing the concept of when you multiply times zero and times one. Again, the answer to multiplying times zero and times one is not a challenge. But what can you say, what statement of generalization can you say about multiplying times zero? And we can communicate that using a variable, such as any number times zero equals zero. And we can write that as n times zero equals zero. So, okay, so I, so I, I kind of get that it's woven into the curriculum yes. along the way. How do you know in eighth grade that they've actually somehow put, pulled that together and that they're actually competent in algebra or ready to be? So uh, the CMP3 program that we have has the algebra standards um, in it. And, and Stephanie may jump in, this being my second year in Charlotte and, and working with eighth grade, I'm not quite as knowledgeable of the CMP program. But there, in, within the Common Core Standards, which is what we use as a guide for our instruction, is there is the eighth grade standards and there are the eighth grade algebra standards if you want, um, what, what did they call that in the Common Core? It's the, it's the eighth grade algebra standards right. combined. Right. Um, so when we adopted the up the current um, CMP program, the work of the math coordinators <laughs> around algebra was very intentional knowing that we needed to address the fact that it, with the adoption of that and the adoption of the Common Core state standards that we were no longer offering two mathematics classes at eighth grade. Previously, we'd been offering eighth grade mathematics and algebra in eighth grade. All of those algebra standards and those core concepts and skills associated with Algebra One are embedded within the current CMP program. We do know that some kids are completely ready for that. Having an eighth grader myself right now, I'm working with her at night and I'm looking at the fact that what she's doing, I did in a mix of pre-algebra, algebra one, a little bit of my geometry in high school and there's a little algebra two in there from what I had. So we also know that some kids are, are not ready necessarily for mastery of those, but they benefit from the exposure and the direct instruction and the differentiation. So how we have accountability for knowing that is with every CMP assessment, there are the core eighth grade standards assessed on every unit assessment, but there are also targeted questions on each assessment that are directly connected to the algebra standard. And so as we're scoring students on those, we know if they're reaching proficiency on those standards or not. And throughout the year, that really becomes a year-long conversation with their teacher about how they are progressing through not only eighth grade mathematics, but eighth grade algebra. And those conversations start early in the fall because students are very tuned into what will I be taking when I come over to CVU. In the end, they need the teacher recommendation, which depends on their performance on those algebra standards as assessed. And so, their demonstration as students <laughs> provides the evidence for the teacher to make the recommendation that this student would benefit from another year of Algebra One. We do have some students who would benefit from pre-Algebra and Algebra One. Um, and then we have students who are ready to just go right into geometry. Okay, so the, <clears throat> the assessment informs their ninth grade placement. Absolutely. Uh, but there's not necessarily a standard that they have to achieve by eighth grade because there are different paths in high school. Right. They, we, the goal is for them to achieve proficiency in the eighth grade math standards. Um, and that's where it, it, the student piece comes in. First of all, their personalized learning. What, what are they ready for? Are they ready to demonstrate that? For some students, that becomes highly motivating and that's where we see them start to, to really push themselves. And they may have to work harder, but their desire is to enter in geometry. So there has been quite a bit of talk about fluency and what does fluency mean in terms of um, the Common Core Standards. And 
these are the fluency requirements that really come right from the Common Core Standards. I think the other thing that's important is to, that automaticity is not fluency. Automaticity, automaticity is part of fluency, but you want to be really um, proficient, but you, has, you have to have multiple strategies and be able to connect, make the connection between strategies. So you can see within um, K and 1, there's your, there's your automaticity with facts. You can see that with um, into grade 3 and 4 um, and grade 5 with some, some facts. But you can also see the multi-digit fluency that is expected. Um, and we really want students to have that, those multiple strategies. I guess I can't stress that enough. So the pictures we've included, I think, speak directly to that idea of having, flex, we call it flexible pathways or multiple, multiple pathways, flexible approaches. Um, and what you're seeing up there are three different examples of the use of number lines in working with number sense and operations. The middle photo comes from, I think it's second grade. second grade, which is more of a scaffolded number line, which allows for the differentiation of students who are maybe still counting by one. They might be counting by groups of fives or tens. They're used to structures that you're seeing, which are the different color-coded parts of the number line. They're used to working with individual units, but also units of five, units of 10. Um, and it opens that up for them to flexibly approach this with the goal of, if they're one-to-one -one correspondence counters, getting them to work and work with numbers and add and subtract within groups of five or 10. The picture on the right shows a, a further stage in that where we have students working on open number lines, where they might be working with numbers of greater value and greater magnitude, and there's the flexibility of students when they're adding and subtracting, adding or subtracting, working forward or backwards on that line, working in chunks of hundreds, tens, fives, and ones. Um, and that, again, allows for that differentiation we're opening up the number line, so we're expecting that they're not counting or adding one by one anymore, but the jumps and leaps they take are dependent upon where they are in that progression and that of the concept and of the skill. Penny, do you want to do the picture on the sure. left? Because you, oh, that was a group that of students just last that. week. So these students are placing fractions and decimals to the hundredths on a number line. Um, I believe that number line went from zero to five and they were creating numbers and placing them on the number line. Um, these two students are having a discussion about whether a number goes between two different numbers. And now we're talking about really that application of place value into involving whole numbers and tenths and hundredths. So, so far we've talked mostly about the math that students are doing, um, how we're teaching, how they're learning, programming. We've also spent a great deal of time over the last several years with professional development around best practices in teaching mathematics, which is focusing more on how we teach and not just on what we teach. At this point, we are in our second year of, well, second year of sustaining growth model where all of our cohorts of teachers are in a sustaining growth model, meaning all of our teachers that have been with us over those years have done three intensive years of studio model where they've had embedded professional development four times a year with a consultant from the teacher's development group. And we're now at the point where Penny leads those studios and we're working in two cohorts, a K-4 and a 5-8 and we meet twice a year with each cohort and we'll go through what the studio model is but also the research and the, the pedagogy associated with best practices. Do you want to talk about habits or do you want me to? Um, so the habits 
of mind and the habits of interaction, these are actually um, things that we teach kids on how to interact with the math, the interactions, and then the use of you know connections and representations, um, all at the service of making sense. It's really all about doing the math to make sense, to justify and generalize and make sense of the mathematics. And that's really done by having productive teaching routines. And this is really about the, the work that we are doing in our classrooms all the time, of being really intentional about our work and our planning for the math instruction, structuring students' mathematical talk, such as thinking about what are we expecting students to say and how are we going to respond to that? The selecting in sequence. When students are having different ideas, how do we want to share that with the rest of the class? And in what order do we want to do that? Um, having the opportunity to confer with students, either one-on-one -on -one in small groups, when are we going to do that? Really, that again, that intentional planning. Using students' mathematical representation. It's always more powerful to use a student's piece of work than to use a teacher-created piece of work. Um, and I would say uh, a huge kind of thing that we're all, all teachers are always saying is that when we make a mistake, that's the opportunity for learning. And, and we'll say to all students, if you've made a mistake, how do you know you made a mistake? Where was the mistake and what did you do to fix it? That's deepening their understanding. And with young children, it's always a celebration. You made a mistake, you changed your thinking, then you just learned something new. And, and the research that Joe Bowler has come, really come with from Stanford is when errors happen, learning happens. If no errors happen, then no new learning is happening. So. Yeah, Maybe explain a little bit how um, how that is made effective in a classroom. In other words, like I get that rather than lecturing and asking kids to memorize, you're equipping them with different strategies to approach a problem, and whether it's the number lines or whatever it is, they've got different tools that they can really grasp the concept more than just mm -hmm. repeating um, solution. You know, the answer. So and I guess what I, where I kind of was trying to explore was this idea of sort of you want to give them those tools, but it sounds like you're teasing it out of them by getting them to try something or make a mistake. And the class time is so short. How do you not let that sort of slip into something that doesn't engage all the kids and, and move, move the thing forward? I think the biggest part is the culture of the classroom. Creating a culture, and that's why you know they call these routines. Creating a culture in a class that is really safe and a celebration of new learning. Um, the, the the example that always comes to my head was a few years ago teaching a group of fifth graders who really hated school and were really reluctant to try new things and to do things on their own. And this one student once said, I know my answer is wrong, but I'm not sure why. And I always think about, I can, you know how you can do a problem and you have no idea that it's incorrect or correct or not? And then, you, then, then kind of the next step of learning is you do something and you identify that it doesn't, it's not reasonable. There's a step in that learning. The next step would be, I know that it's incorrect, and I think this is where my mistake was. And then the next step would be where to, how to fix that. And one of the ways that I think is, you know, along with having a culture that's safe for children to talk to one another, and I think the talking is so, so big, is oftentimes, um, if you went back, there was that private reasoning time as part of the habits. Mm -hmm. But then that idea is you work on your own. And now I'm going to turn and I'm going to talk to a partner and I'm going to share and talk about how I approach this problem. Do we agree? Do we agree on what we did? We came up with different answers. And so I will often encourage kids, oh, you have different answers? Okay, talk about it. How do you do it? And 
I would say nine times out of 10, they start and they're like, oh, I know, I know what I did. And so there's that excitement of, I know what I did because I discovered what my error was and I discovered how to fix it. Now I think what's really important is that's not being left up to chance. The teacher is really intentional in the types of work that they're giving students and the pairings that they're giving students so that that can happen. And that's what I was going to add as the second most important piece, I think, is the intentionality that has come through the shared learning our teachers have done, largely through studio. While it's focused on productive teaching routines and habits of mind and habits of interaction, we've also spent time in every studio digging into how conceptual understanding progresses over time. So multiplicative reasoning from the earliest sense of skip counting up to multiplying with variables. Um, and so with the studio model, it's also reinforced for teachers how to dissect the lesson in the program, look for intentional opportunities. So where are those high leverage parts in today's lesson, in the focus for today, where are those high leverage parts where we want kids talking and making meaning? When we're structuring students' math talk, do we want them tuning into whether or not they agree or disagree? Do we want them just comparing their thinking? Do we know that we have students coming into today's lesson with really fragile understanding of that concept? And then we might pair and structure so that it's an opportunity for partner A to share their thinking and partner B, who's still a little shaky, gets to revoice the other student's idea, which we know from brain research helps build connections. We look for where's the best place to have students work with a visual model or create a visual model, and then when they talk about it, it takes the understanding of that visual, visual model to another level because they've now interacted in two different ways with it. So it really has been, I think, the pairing of learning about these practices and using them in really structured ways. I think the other thing I would say is these are all high engagement strategies. And so the shift of lecture and presenting material and students receiving material, there's a shift here where they're getting a little bit of material, but then they're constructing their use of it, which increases student engagement. And one of the biggest benefits I've seen in the classroom is then it increases the questions that students are bringing into it. And so they're not just working with the questions that are presented to them, but they're working with questions they have about the material. And often for our students who have a pretty good understanding of the concept coming in, that opens the door to how we go deeper. How do we make it more complex? When they're tuning into the nuances of what's going on and they want to know more, that opens it up for just how far we can differentiate to push them deeper with that concept. So how much support do the teachers get, like in terms of your being able to go to a classroom or having other adults? It just seems like so many things would have to go right. You know what I mean? Like the pairings have to be just so, you know, the questions have to be redirected in a way that's useful for most of the kids, you know. Not to mention everything we've heard about behavior that you've got to control all those variables. Like how do they, do you find there's continuity among different classrooms and is there a way to support teachers? So I think there's um, definitely s support. I, I'm in many classrooms. Um, the math interventionness, one of the uh, changes that we made last year is providing additional push and support. So, um, Kim and Amy, who are providing some intervention, are, are pushing into classrooms. They know the program. The teachers are really confident with them. And we increased that this year because classrooms teachers were saying, that is so helpful for me and my students, having an additional person in here. Um, I, I've moved my office downstairs. I have more people coming in constantly. So we're having lots of conversation about teaching mathematics talking about the students, um, what, what is a misconception? 
I think another big part of studios when we're talking about the lessons, what are the misconceptions I'm anticipating seeing? I think that's for, uh, for me, that's been a really big part of both studio and um, instruction. When we can anticipate common misunderstandings, we know where and how to address them. And I think that's, that's part of having an understanding of the progression. This is what is coming before my grade level, this is what's coming after my grade level, and this is what's commonly difficult for students. And I think that studio really has that opportunity to do that. I would say the other opportunities that teachers are feeling are very supportive because it is a lot. It's, it's pulling together so many different pieces that go into just one part of your day. But what we were talking about with the professional learning communities and the teaming we've embedded this year, um, so they're having regular time to talk and plan with one another and we've seen that spread. Our teams are planning their math lessons together more than they're not. So they ha always have a grade level partner, but we also now have a special educator embedded with those teams. Um, and that's just shared expertise. It also allows for that conversation of, oh, I have a similar student in my room with a similar learning style, and this is what I found really worked. Um, we're also finding that happening vertically and I think that's a benefit of our looping teams is our one two teachers are talking to each other as they're cycling through those loops and our three four team and then we put the five eight studio together because we only have three math teachers spanning five eight but when we have opportunities for Dave and Tasha and Mary to work together and kind of bridge the Bridges elementary curriculum into the connected math that's happening more um, and I think that's been a benefit of embedding those times in our schedule for teachers to work together. Do you want to talk about Math Studio? Sure. Um, so Math Studio kind of broken into two days. Really the idea is that first day um, Stephanie and I or Barbara Ann and I will go around and just do a quick data snap in classrooms. What do we see? What habits of mind and habits of interaction are we seeing? What do we want to be the focus, the instructional focus? Remember we talked about those uh, routines? What do we want to address in the next day's studio as an instructional practice? The day two, the actual studio day, we actually start out by doing the math. Either the math that we'll be, we will observe the students doing or doing some math that's connected to that mathematical idea that is challenging for for the teachers. We want them to experience the habits of mind and habits of interaction. Um, that's really that mathematical knowledge for teachers. And then we will observe the studio lesson and then talk about it. Afterwards, by you know, what did we see? What was the evidence that we saw of the habits? Um, and after that, we take that new learning and apply it into how are you now going to apply what we just saw and did and talked about into your upcoming lessons. Um, the one thing I didn't talk about was in day one, the teacher who volunteers to be the studio teacher, we plan, um, we were doing a half day release, mm -hmm. but people don't like to be out of their classroom. Right. So we've been doing it after school for a couple hours after school, that seems to work better for um, people. And we really go through the lesson very, very detailed in what is the mathematics? What habit of mind or habit of interaction do we really want to focus on? What are we anticipating how students do this math? With what we anticipate, who will we, how will we share that work, that select and sequence? Um, this year, something really interesting happened. Um, actually, two things. A uh, second grade team decided to team teach the studio. So an, um, an unintended consequence of that, after people observe the team teaching, is 
other teachers were thinking, wow, I think I'd like other grade levels. I think I'd like to try doing that team teaching also. So from that studio, that started kind of branching in, not necessarily math, but they're starting to do some more teaming, um, whole group activities, just occasionally. That was an unintended consequence of the studio. The other thing that happened is the studio lesson that was taught was the exact same lesson that was taught two years ago in the studio when Bill Feely was here. And so we were able to see the lesson that they had created from, um, you know, so we have our Bridges textbook, a Bridges teacher's manual, and then we had the lesson that was adapted from the teacher's manual that they had done in studio two years ago. And what we noticed was it had upped the ante. So here was the actual Bridges lesson. Here was what they had planned was more rigorous. And what we did was even built on that. So we, we could really see for the first time that in two years, this same lesson was at a much higher level than it was two years ago. You know, I don't think you would have had the opportunity to clearly see that if we just hadn't happened to have done the exact same lesson. And so that was a great opportunity for us to share with the teachers is here's the lesson in the Bridges program, here's how it was adapted two years ago, and here is how and why we adapted it again. And I think the, the why we adapt is we have our Bridges material, we have our lessons, but we have children in our class that have unique needs. And yes, we're using the materials as they were intended to, but we're using them in response to the children in our class. And so it's not necessarily the same lesson going to be delivered exactly the same way each year. It really is, you know, reliant on the children in the classroom. So that was, that was really exciting that was, for me to see. That was a big celebration. So in a studio lesson, all of our math lessons have always, as we've taken on the math studio model, identified a core math idea. At this point, as we're moving into proficiency-based learning, we're looking at the similarities between core math ideas and learning targets. And the commonality between those is basically you're putting out in front of students what's the target today? What's the goal? What are we going for? They know what they're focusing on. They are expecting what they will be working with. It also helps drive the scales that we use to assess them. Um, as, we, as Penny said, we also identify what habits are we going to focus on? Are we focusing on student questioning? Are we focusing on using math representations to justify an answer? Um, and that's directly related to what we see in classrooms and the data snaps leading up to the studio. We also always make explicit to the full cohort of teachers how the lesson was changed and why. And I think Penny just spoke really nicely to that. And the why really always comes from the students. What we're seeing in them, what their data is showing us, what we know about their current level of understanding, any misconceptions they might have but also what we know about students who have a pretty good understanding of this as they walk through the
fifth grader yeah. right now. Um, and that actually came up in our meetings this week around visioning and our schedule for K-4. Part of the conversation that the cohorts of teachers want to have is around common agreements and common philosophy with the use of homework and the role of mm -hmm. homework. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just, and it's not your, your, it's more, maybe it's more of a question for, um, in general, just because the message is. A few years ago, there was an effort in uh, Chittenden County mm -hmm. to recruit, and I don't know that it was hugely successful, but um, I mean, it's complicated. It's mm -hmm. com First of all, you, you get the applicants that you get, and they might or might not include, mm -hmm. you know, can minority candidates. Mm -hmm. um, we don't normally look at candidates based on 
you know, that kind of status. We're looking for uh, what kind of program did they have, what kind of experience did they, did they have. But this particular initiative back, you know, maybe even like six, seven years ago was, was really focused on let's first get the pool and then we can look at it. And um, I remember attending a session at Champlain College. So this was a few years ago. And we had some minority uh, candidates there who had come and not stayed and explained what, what's the challenge in just getting people to come to Vermont. Right. So it's, it's a challenge on both ends, right? How do you find the candidates and get them to apply? I will tell you that um, uh, School Spring, which is the program that we use, is the national. It's, it's what everybody uses in the whole country. So we're definitely getting the word out to the whole world when we have positions. I'm writing it down because I really, I, I, I don't know that there are any current initiatives around. Um, well, one thing I'd be curious about is, yeah. is just what's, how Burlington is managing to, to capture, I think. Okay, excellent. Um, Barbara, I turn it over to you. All right, so um, there was a request from all of you to hear from us around an update around our climate. So I want to introduce Cassandra Townsend, who is our behavior coordinator and coach, who's here with me and we will do a presentation. Mm -hmm. um, and oh, cool. we'll be ready to go. Big 
So I wanted to start off by just showing our mission. It is something you've seen before, but it's something that we have to show over and over again because we live this. Everything that we're about to share connects to believing that learning, thinking, living, and contributing and pursuing excellence is at the core of everything we do. So this evening, we will be sharing our latest climate data, we'll be sharing how data has been used to inform our actions, and we'll be giving you a PBIS update. So people asked for some data, and this is one way to look at our data. This specifically is showing our school on the right as compared to the national standard of the percentage of students in each of the tiers. You've had a conversation here before around PBIS. Let me just uh, remind people a little bit about it. PBIS is a positive behavior system. In that system, it is expected that there is a universal support, intervention, and programming around climate for all the students. Then, for students who need a little bit more, there is a targeted approach, interventions, and supports provided. That is the yellow. And then, for those who need even more, there is intensive supports, interventions provided. And this shows you the proportion of what is considered the national standard, where you'd have about 80% of the students receiving the universal, about 15% needing a little bit more, and 5% needing the most intensive. What this is showing about us is that in two of the categories, we're doing even better. We have 83% of our students receive universal, only 10% need the targeted, and then we do have more needing intensive at the 6%. So this is one way to look at the data. How that is measured, if you look on the right, it is ODR stands for the Office Referral System, and it's saying that 83% of students in our school receive zero to one office referral. This data is up to date as of 131. So 83% of our students have received zero or one referral. That that's really is positive. Two to five is the yellow, so we have 10% that have received up through 131, two to five, and then six plus, we have six percent. Here's another way to look at our data. This is also up to date as of 131. And this is across the months of this year. There's a trend that's going <laughs> down, which is really good. There's been a decrease. So now we're gonna talk about why the decrease, what we've been doing. We studied the data. It has been a collaborative team effort to look at this data and come up with ways that we're going to bring these, those numbers down. We looked at where things were happening, when, how, and that informed our decisions and our action steps. We also went to the students. We needed to hear student voice, and we went to the students in, in a number of areas I was holding some uh, cookies with the principal, um, the Student Support Center, they were holding some focus groups. There was another group that even went to the high school and spoke up. They told us what they needed. And we'll go into more details about these in some other slides, but some of the things that they were looking for, some alternative space, they wanted some cafeteria updates in the environment and the climate. They wanted some structure and collaborative games outdoors during recess. They wanted more movement. That came up pretty loudly. More voice, more choice. We've done many action steps and we've had previous meetings where we've shared some. Here are some others. We have been working at the classroom level, focusing on building relationships, giving behavior specific feedback where teachers are talking to the kids about what they're seeing. We've been giving more opportunities for choice and for movement. In the hallway, there are adults in the hallways almost all the time during the transitions. Playground and cafeteria, we talked about the environment, trying to improve what it looks like, what it feels like, organize activities. Alternative lunches, the um, direction center upstairs hosts students during lunchtime. 
And there are a lot of children that go because there they sometimes could have smaller conversations, less noise, or different abilities to move around. For the olders, we continue to have access to um, sometimes the NPR for movement, to the band room, to be able to hang out and chill with Andy. It, and also we also have to offer the library open as well. The bus, we've become clear with expectations. There is regular monthly meetings with the bus drivers as well as daily check-ins. In PBIS, there are five pillars that make a strong positive behavior system. And clear consistency of expectations, procedures for teaching those expectations, clear and consistent responses to behavior, collection of data and use of data to inform decisions, and an acknowledgement system. We have the four, first four in place in this presentation tonight. You'll hear more about number five and what we're doing about that. I'll show you a little bit about some of these. So here is our clear and consistent expectations. You've seen these before. They're live with the kids. They know them. If you, could ask, if you ask them, they will tell you. Clear and consistent teaching of the expectations. We needed to be clear on where, across every setting, what it looks like and sounds like to be taking care of self, others, and this place. And we have made certain that there's teaching of that. Clear and consistent responses to problem behavior. We understand behavior as communication. We understand that when children are communicating, they're often trying to tell us what they want more of or what they want to avoid. We understand that teaching around behavior has to be focused on learning and education of the whole child. So how we respond to behavior, we have four pieces. One is reflection, where we encourage and support the child in reflecting on their behavior and the impact on others. We have another piece that's repair work, really believing that when a child does something that's not expected behavior, it does impact the community. And that for the child to feel right about it, as well as for the community to feel right about it, repair work is helpful. Natural consequence. It means that for what the child has done, there's a natural, something that makes sense in terms of what's going to happen next. And sometimes that relates to the repair work, and sometimes it's just a natural consequence of, that, of where there's maybe a loss of privilege based on what has happened. In education, we support the child in learning, learning more about themselves, learning more about impact of what they did, and we identify what are the, mis what are the missing understandings that led to the unexpected behavior. So, I mentioned that the, num the fifth piece, the acknowledgement system, was the one that was not yet in place. But it is now, and I am now going to pass it over to Cassandra. Thank you, Irene. So I'm excited to talk with all of you, especially after the math presentation, because when I think about behavior, you take math, the word math, out of all of that great conversation and presentation, and plug in behavior, the principles are the same, and how we respond to behavior is the same. We have behavioral errors, just like we have math errors, right? Those are all opportunities for learning. And so when Barbara Ann was just talking a little bit about this, one of the things we've done really intentionally is focusing on streamlining and providing intentional focused education to students who engage in behavioral errors. So we're really focusing on the education piece along with all of that. So part of learning, though, is getting feedback, right? We always need fat feedback on our performance. We also need feedback on our own behavior, right? So when you have an acknowledgement system in place, whether you like the word acknowledgement, reward, it doesn't matter, um, 
what you're really doing is giving an increase in opportunities to give positive feedback to our students, letting them know when they're engaged in positive behavior that's helping our community. And so this is not my brainchild. This is a collective effort from a representative PBIS leadership team at Charlotte Central School across um, representation across K-8. And um, our PBIS team got together and really listened to students. We listened to our staff in terms of what made sense for their for their um, in terms of uh, an acknowledgement system and this is what we came up with so really focusing on um, using pennies because it just makes sense and I'll get into that in a second so what is our acknowledgement program our acknowledgement system called we played along of, um, we have a penny. There's lots of great ways you can use the word penny and make um, you know, different things. So be the change, right? Be the change at CCS. Taking care of ourselves, taking care of others, and taking care of this place, it just makes sense. So we're honoring the past with our expectations, but we're, we're um, rejuvenating what does that mean in our school. So be the change at CCS, that's what it's called. Many people are wondering, why did we pick the penny? We didn't just randomly say, okay, we're gonna pay children to, to do good deeds at school, that's not at all. What we wanted to do is think about the culture of Charlotte Central School and really think about the culture context when deciding what our acknowledgement system was. Now in the past, we have had an, a tangible ticket system that got mixed reviews. It worked with some cohorts of students, not so much with others. This is what the staff was telling us. But what we wanted to do is think about something um, that was sustainable, pennies. Everybody has a penny jar. Um, also something that was educational. How can you use, I mean, there are multiple ways to use a penny and apply it into very different educational opportunities. The other thing that was really exciting that speaks to, I think, a core value for Charlotte Central School is this opportunity to pay it forward. So what does it mean to pay it forward? What it means is when individual students, this is my friend here, he was helping me make a student support center sign. My friend here does something positive in the school to take care of this place. I could acknowledge him very using behavior spe specific praise and say, you know what? Thank you so much for helping me take care of this place by putting up this sign in me. That student's positive behavior then translates and goes into the classroom mason jar, right? Once that mason jar gets to a certain height, the school and the teachers have autonomy to decide what that celebration looks like. Okay, so it's not something that's dictated. It takes into account the culture of each classroom. Once that happens, the jar goes into the school-wide penny bank. Okay, and you'll see it in our lobby if you haven't seen it yet. Once that's full, we will be donating the, the pennies that have been accumulated because of all of our students' positive behavior to support a local organization that is chosen by our students. So it's again, it's, it's a little different than before, but again, this team decided to take this an, to another step and really considering the values of our community at Charlotte. Okay, we can't do this without some sort of data, right? Because you're probably like, well, what did we just roll this out? So you might be thinking, well, what did your staff think about this, right? So I love data. I love quantitative data. I also like qualitative data. And sometimes it's nice to get a snapshot of what our staff members said after we rolled out this acknowledgement system. By the way, before we even rolled this out, we got 97% buy-in from staff recommitting to focusing on a positive system, an acknowledgement system, which is huge. So we have a high level 
of staff buy-in for acknowledging positive behavior in our school. So again, I, you can read all these, but this is very, um, all of these are representative of much of the feedback that we got from our staff. We did a post survey after we rolled this out. It's positive. It's this, this new acknowledgement system will nurture relationships between all age groups. Again, this is a school-wide acknowledgement system. How it looks at each grade may be a little different. So there's a lot of flexibility for this to take a life of its own within the autonomy of each teacher's preferences and the students' preferences and the grade levels. So lots of opportunities for differentiation. And I really like this one. Our students are all about being change makers to benefit our school and community. Excellent. So we're really excited about this new system of giving positive feedback. Because when we talk about behavior, right, we often focus on the negative, right? And this isn't just an acknowledgement. There's often a misconception that these acknowledgement systems are only there to benefit students who are having difficult problem behaviors. That's not the case. We want to acknowledge every single student in our building who does the right thing every single day, right? So that's why we want to have this acknowledgement system. We have other incentives and other plans for students on individualized plans. They will also have access to this universal intervention, as any student would when you're talking about academics, high quality first instruction for all. All students will. But again, we want to make an effort in creating a positive culture by acknowledging all of our students, especially those who are doing the right thing every day. Engaging families and community is essential. Homeschool connection is key. We've made a draft flyer pamphlet. It's a trifold flyer that explains our new acknowledgement system. I've already been in contact with one of our local Charlotte stores. Actually, this morning on my way to work, we stopped by. I said, hey, this is what we're doing. You want to help us out? She said, sure, bring some penny rolls and a poster. So that's what I'm going to do on Monday, or on tomorrow, actually. What's today? Tuesday, Wednesday. So I'm going to do that tomorrow. I'm going to, on my way to work, I'm going to bring her some penny rolls, get her a sign. When you see students in the community demonstrating that they're able to take care of themselves, um, take care of others, and take care of your store, give them a penny. Right? So that's kind of exciting. So thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So in closing, I want to make certain that we acknowledge and thank all of the CCS staff. This has been a collaborative effort, a team effort, based on a commitment to meeting the needs of all the children. So I want to make sure everybody knows we, did, we couldn't do this alone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So I'll open it up for questions from the board, the audience, anybody? Oh, just one question. Yeah, go for it. You have the data showing a pretty steep decline in mm -hmm. referrals. Is that something that sort of uh, subjectively is being um, reflected in how teachers are, are talking about the situation now? I mean, do you feel like they're noticing that same Obviously, they're writing the referrals, I suppose. They should be noticing the change. But is the climate with the staff uh, reflecting that? I think it's palpably different. I think we can feel it's different, yes. Positively different, yeah. Good. And we've had years and years of this type of data. I've seen that those graphs many times. <laughs> and is that decline sharper this year than it has been in other years? I don't remember it being that quick of a downslope at this point in time. So it's more significant of a decline yes. than just typical month to month yes, over the course so. of the year okay mm -hmm. we also rallied mm. yeah. yeah well I, I'm I was hoping that it was a reflection of your efforts and not just mm -hmm. kind of the months how they mm -hmm. play out because they do have some ups and downs some good months bad months kind of thing because <coughs> yeah, typically actually I think those graphs would show winters mm -hmm. as uh, more steeper mm -hmm. as they're trapped inside more and, right. and that sort of thing so it's it's okay. I think some of the systems we put in place too you know with having Cassandra available as a coach and doing behavior data reviews with mm -hmm. every team on a regular basis we put those behavior data reviews into the calendar based on where we were seeing 
data spikes, but proactively. So when we knew, you know, this month tends mm -hmm. to be high as we're creeping towards a vacation, we would do, we put the behavior data review a few weeks before that, which just gave more resources to teachers to head it off at the pass, mm -hmm. to really be prepared for it, be proactive, think about what resources we might need. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I would just say um, two excellent presentations this evening. I'd encourage you, I, I don't even know if you can do this through RETN, to in one of your Friday newsletters put a link in to those two Great. presentations. Anything that doesn't show me on camera is fine. And uh, um, to those two parts of the meeting so people can see it. Uh, you know, um, everybody's always asking for information. Any way we can get it to them is, is better. I, again, I'm not sure that's possible. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Um, we are way behind, so <laughs> I am going to really fly through a couple yeah, things. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> uh, CVSD debrief. This is the Champlain Valley School District. Um, two big things. Uh, the budget is done. There will be a flyer in the paper, um, Charlotte News and other papers, in the next week uh, detailing that, uh, and teacher negotiations are ongoing. Uh, 5.3, the CSSU debrief. Um, there's a report in here. Is there anything to highlight in particular? I don't think so. It was pretty. the presentation from our insurance broker. Yeah, we, all right. Uh, we had a presentation from the insurance broker tonight about coverage for the for the, for the the schools and property, and it was really um, as exciting as that sounds. <laughs> um, Can I ask, um, yes. What's the timeline for teacher, for the, for um, coming to resolution on a contract, <laughs> or is there a um, the the meetings are ongoing. Uh, the next one isn't scheduled till mid March. Um, there is no clear timeline as to when that's going to be over. Um, there's a hope and a prayer that it's done sometime before summer. I'm not, I'm not sure that how how close we're going to get to it. And the existing contract ends at the, does it end at the end of this school year? Yes, and uh, just because we don't complete by the end of the school year doesn't mean, you know, there would have to be a whole, you can go into the next school year without the contract. Now, having said that, you know, there's a whole other problem that could arise from that, but um, that's where we are at the moment. Um, second quarter FMR, I looked at it briefly. Do you may, anybody have any particular comments? We're ahead by... It looks pretty positive. <laughs> it's, 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 it's looking good. It's looking good. It's looking good. It's looking good. That's right. That's where you're going. That's the cause. Given, our, given the way uh, the budget went last year, it's nice to be ahead. So thank you. Um, pray for uh, no, no cold snaps. Um, facilities, um, nothing huge this month? No. Mm -hmm. No, um, in the CVSD budget, as I think I said last month, there's some money for the roof for the building. So that's you know, going out for a bit. Um, moving on to discussion matters, uh, the board's corner topic. I, the next um, paper will have an insert from the CVSD board about the budget. Um, that's probably where we should leave it for this time. Um, there is informational meetings on the budget. Um, the night before uh, town meeting um, at 6, 6 at the NPR, I think that's right. Uh, and there's also February 23rd here, there's the annual meeting of the CVSD board for that sort of thing. Um, so I think we're okay for the coming paper, but if anybody has any topics they'd like to go forward with, uh, going forward, as always, um, send me an email or send Lynn an email down at the Charlotte News. Uh, they've become very active. They're, it's it's um, the editor, especially on social media and stuff, lots of stuff going out. We have no action matters this evening. Um, the consent agenda, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Second. And I know there was one correction to one of the special meetings, the attendance, um, um, Susan didn't, uh, was not able to attend the December 20th meeting. So if we approve it with that. Correction, um, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. Um, there's a thousand meeting dates here at the bottom. <laughs> um, 
I will leave you to read through them. We have no executive session. Motion to adjourn. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.